Wow, North Coast Church, summer is finally here. Hopefully you've already scheduled some downtime with some friends or family to decompress and get recharged. Well, we wanna help you get recharged this summer with some of our summer events and classes that are gonna be taking place at a variety of our campuses and online. To be able to find out more information, simply go to our website, northcoastchurch.com, and look for the summer events banner. There you're gonna find out all sorts of information, uh, some information that's gonna be to your particular campus, or you can search for our online classes as well. We've got marriage nights, we've got uh, mental reset nights, and we've got a variety of nights just to be able to help build some fun and some connection to North Coast Church. So please register for those classes as soon as you can so we know how many people to anticipate. Well, let's go ahead and get ready for today's message. Pastor Larry Osborne's got another great one for us as we continue in the series in David. So make sure you've downloaded your message notes. You can get them on our website or our North Coast Church app. You can fill out your prayer request or you can give online. Now let's go ahead and join our worship team and then get ready for today's message.
Last weekend, we took a look at the death of Saul's son, Ishbosheth, and the punishment of those who were his murderers, and the coronation of King David finally becoming king of all of Israel. And uh, we use that also to uh, kind of a springboard into dealing with a cancel culture question, which is simply, how in the world can God bless such a violent culture, violent people, and in the case of David, even a violent man? Well, today we're going to look at the coronation of David as king of all of Israel. We're going to also take a look at his early days and his early reign as king and see how God established him and fulfilled all the promises that God had made. And along the way, we're going to also step back and we're going to try to figure out what are some of the principles that we can learn as we look at David waiting so long for all of this to take place in his life. So, I want to just dig right into the passage, so grab your Bible or digital device, and and let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 5. The first five verses were briefly read last weekend as we were kind of tying up the story of Ishbosheth's death, which opened up the door for him to no longer be king of just one tribe, uh, Judah, but also uh, king over all uh, 12 of the tribes. So it's now 22 to maybe 25 years after the prophet Samuel had come and found this shepherd boy and poured the oil upon him and given God's anointing that he was to be the king of Israel. 22 to 25 years. I want you to think back in your own mind what you were doing. Some of you weren't even around here, but the rest of you, what were you doing 22 to 25 years ago? And imagine God had made a crystal clear uh, promise to you with a prophet coming along. Everybody in the family seen it over the next couple of years, everybody in the kingdom knowing about that. And now it's only now finally taking place. For the past seven years, you've been king over one of the tribes, your tribe, Judah, in a place called Hebron. And now because of Ishbosheth's death or murder, actually, what has happened is the whole nation of Israel, all the rest of the leaders of the other 11 tribes have come to you and said, hey, we've known you're supposed to be king. We're finally willing to acknowledge you as king. So let's read these verses. First five verses here. Verse 1 of 2 Samuel chapter 5, all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, hey, we're your own flesh and blood. We're fellow descendants of Abraham. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns, the early years of David's uh, uh, life and adulthood. And the Lord said to you, you will be shepherd, you will shepherd my people Israel and you will become their ruler. Well, when all the rulers of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, the king made a covenant, a contract with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed King David as king over all Israel. Now, David was 30 years old when he first became king in Hebron over Judah, and he reigned for a total of 40 years in Hebron, seven years and six months. 
and in Jerusalem for 33 years for that total of 40 years. And now the next verses begin to pick up the story of how God is establishing David as the rightful king, the one whose uh, lineage, the Messiah himself, Jesus Christ, would indeed be born uh, in. And there are three kind of important things that we're going to follow along as, as, as we, we read this. And the first important thing that happens is the conquest of Jerusalem. He conquers it and turns it into a new capital of his kingdom. So number one, Jerusalem. Okay? Jerusalem is, is under Canaanite pagan control. It's a hyper uh, fortified city. The Israelites have never been able to conquer it. And now David conquers it and he decides to set it up as the place uh, of, of his kingdom. Verse 6. The king and his men marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites. Those were the Canaanites that lived there. And they said to David, you're not going to get in here. Even the blind and the lame can ward you off. For they thought David could not get in here. That's how well fortified that city was, Jerusalem. Uh, they thought, you know what? Even if you had a, a city full of lame people and, and blind people, it is so protected that no one is ever going to be able to conquer it. Well, nevertheless, despite the fact that no one else had been able to do it in the past, David captured the fortress of Zion, which is now called the city of David. And on that day, David said, hey, anyone who conquers the Jebusites will have to use the water shaft to reach those lame and blind who are David's enemies. In other words, that was the strategic, brilliant plan that he had to be able to get around the very steep walls of fortification, everything that made them feel as if no one would ever be able to attack them. Then David took up residence in the fortress and he called it the city of David. He built up the area around it from the terraces inward and he became more and more powerful. Catch this, because the Lord God Almighty was with him. The Lord is establishing the place from which he's going to reign and from which God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he returns, is going to reign. Now, the second important thing took place when a, pla uh, uh, a country called Tyre acknowledged David's not only legitimacy as king, but his power. They paid tribute or taxes, if you will, in the form of sending all kinds of materials and skilled workmen to be able to build David an appropriate house. Well, well, think about how powerful David must have been in their mindset to, for them to go, this powerful city of Tyre, to say, hey, we've got to make an alliance with this guy, and we've basically got to buy him off uh, with uh, all kinds of materials we're going to send to build this castle and with the workers to actually do it. So we read this in verses 11 to 13. Now Hiram, king of Tyre, sent envoys to David, along with cedar logs and carpenters and stonemasons, and they built a palace for David. And, and now I love this. Catch this. It's going to be important later. Then David knew that God had established him as king over Israel and had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. If you're marking up your Bible, you want to circle, then David knew, and also circle for the sake of the, his people Israel. It was this experience with the king of Tyre sending all of this stuff that David suddenly, it's if you, you maybe have had this happen to you, where you, you know something's happening, and then you realize, like, ah, oh, this is not a dream. This is, like, real. It's finally happened. This is the point at which David knows God is fulfilled, actually, literally fulfilled, everything he promised. And David also was aware of why God had promised that to him, not just to bless David as an individual, but to bless the nation through David. And that's what makes the next verses so ironic. Because beginning in verse 13, it says, after he left Hebron, David took more concubines and wives in Jerusalem, and more sons and daughters were born to him. And then he gives the names of them. Now, this is strange because the taking of concubines and the taking of other wives unto himself is about the most selfish thing you can do. 
it was uh, it was uh, selfish in that sense. It was also just a blatant sin, and it was one of those cultural blind spots we, uh, we talked about last weekend. It was a blatant sin because kings were clearly forbidden to multiply wives. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy were the books of the law that God gave to Moses, and 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 David had these. His, his, his prophets had the scrolls, they, uh, his, his, his scribes, his religious leaders, priests had that. And, and here's what it says, Deuteronomy 17, 17, of the, any king they would ever have. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart run away. Well, how did he do it? Well, that's back to the blind spots we talked about last week. You see, culturally, this is what every other king did. And my bet is David and, and the people looking on saw his multiplying of concubines, wives, and all the sons that God gave to him as a blessing. But of course, if we fast forward through the rest of David's life, what we see is almost all of the hardship and troubles in his life came through his relationships with women, his lust his multiple wives, and his multiple sons. So the fact that God overlooked it was no sense of God approving it, um, but that's what he did. Now, the third important thing that took place in David's early days as king was a series of definitive and lasting victories over a group of people called the Philistines. The the Philistines were the uh, just long-term kind of whack-a-mole enemies of Israel. They'd win a victory, they'd lose it, win, lose, win, lose. At the very beginning of David's fame was his battle with Goliath, this giant oversized Philistine. But uh, they had regathered their troops and multiple times had continued to create problems. And so we pick it up now in verse 17 of 2 Samuel 5. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, they went up in full sore force to search for him. They want to go to battle. They want to knock him off. But David heard about it. And he went down to the stronghold. And now the Philistines had come and spread out in the valley of Rephaimai. And so David inquired of the Lord, shall I go to attack uh, the Philistines? We deliver them into my hands. And the Lord answered, go, for I will surely deliver the Philistines into your hands. So he goes to a place called Bel Parazim, and there he defeats him. And he said, man, it, this defeat is so great. It's as waters break out, you know, just kind of from a dam that's broken, just go like that. He says, so the Lord has broken out against my enemies before me. So that place was called Bel Parazim, which means the Lord has broken out. And the Philistines were so defeated, they had abandoned their idols there, and David and his men carried them off. But... In due time, they gathered back together, and verse 22 says, Once more the Philistines came up, and they spread out in the valley of Reph, I me. And so David inquired of the Lord, and he answered, Well, this time, don't go straight up, but circle around behind them and attack them in front of the poplar trees. As soon as you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the poplar trees, whatever the heck that was, move quickly, because that will mean the Lord has gone out in front of you to strike the Philistine enemy. So David did as the Lord said, and the Lord commanded him. And he struck down the Philistines all the way from Gibeon to Gazar. Now, David is firmly established as king. He's not just coronated as king. God has established him with the city. God has established him with the material things. God has established him with peace with other nations. God has established him with uh, definitive victories over his enemies. But again, I want to bring you back to this. It's been 25 years. So here's what I want to do with the rest of our time. I want to step back and I want to look at how God fulfilled his promise in David's life. The process that God used, the decades of waiting and how God was at work in those. I want us to take a look to see what we can learn about God's waiting room and living there. And I also want to just give you some practical advice. We're just sitting down at our favorite coffee place, and you're asking me uh, questions like, oh, well, I, I know God's going to take a long time here, but how do I deal with this? How do I think about this? What do I do? So I want to get really practical with some, some life advice that I have given to others, that I've given to myself in the mirror, and I hope that you will find faithful when you find yourself, and I know some of you are right now there, in God's waiting room. 
And God is saying to you, or you're at least feeling like it, he's saying, hurry up and wait. So we've got a number of things. So let me put them up here on, on the screen. And the first one is this. When you feel like you're stuck in God's waiting room, ask yourself this question. Is this a promise from God or is this wishful thinking? Is this a promise from God or is this wishful thinking? Now, here's what I mean by that. Satan's favorite trick is to get us to believe that God has said something he didn't say or promised something he never promised. It goes all the way to the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. He comes to Eve and he said, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And that's not what God has said. God has said you can eat of anything here except for this one tree. But just with that subtle twist, did God say you can't eat of any? Next thing she, you know, she's saying, well, we, I think we're not supposed to touch. And, and, and she's down this road. And it's the same road he loves to take us where we lose our confidence in God. We, we start to question what we know he said to us very clearly uh, in the past. And so one of the things we've got to watch out for is this tendency that we can have in our culture or from other well-meaning people uh, who want to encourage us or sometimes some goofy Bible teaching where we assume that God has made a promise to us that he's never, ever made. So I'm going to give you three examples. These are not the only ones, but they're three biblical examples of promises that I find sometimes we're claiming and going, God, where are you? Why haven't you done this? And God never made that promise. Now, now here's a warning. This is going to frustrate some of you. There's never a time where I teach some of these principles that I don't uh, get some emails because people are triggered to go, well, wait a minute. I've always hoped. I've always planned on it. And, and here's a weird thing. Uh, often in those emails or those questions, they go, well, I know that it says, but. And uh, what they're basically saying is, you know what? I would rather have happy talk and wishful thinking that's not true then align my life with the actual truth. It's like, well, I only want to go to a doctor who's going to tell me I'm well, uh, even if I'm riddled with cancer. So let's take a look at these. And again, I just acknowledge up front, some of you are going to go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Just wait until I'm all done before you type up that email, write out that worship response card. Because if you listen carefully, I, I think you'll have no argument that, yep, yeah, these aren't really what many of us have thought they would be. So the first one is a famous verse in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. We like to see it on plaques and coffee mugs. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Now, here's what many have done with this. We've taken a dream, an idea, uh, uh, an endeavor that we're starting, whatever it would be, and we, we then take this verse and we go, hey, God has promised to prosper me in what I do, my, 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 my workplace, my relationships, uh, what commitments I have. I've just sold everything to pursue this dream over here, whatever it would be. Hey, I, I'm okay with this because I know God has told me. He has plans, and they are to prosper me and not to harm me, plans to give me hope and a future. But if we look at the context of this, this isn't a promise that was made to you and to me. This is a promise that Jeremiah gave from the Lord to a group of Jews that were in exile in Babylon. And they were going to be there. They were stuck there for 70 years. And along the way, he's telling them, settle down, marry and have children. But I want you to know you're not going to be stuck here forever. That this is what God promised you would happen if as a nation you turn your back on God and, and, and uh, followed false gods and all of these other things. He told you he would send you into exile and you'd be ruled over by your enemies. But he also told you after that timeout was done, after that discipline was done, that he was going to bring you back into the land. And that's what Jeremiah is, is telling them here. Notice, I'm not going to put it up on the board, but just listen carefully. Notice the full context of this passage. Jeremiah chapter 10, beginning verse 14. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, you're done with the 70 years in Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. What's the promise? I'll take you out of Babylon and send you back to Israel. And then he says, 
for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper y'all and not to harm y'all. These are plurals, by the way, plans to give you a hope and a future. And then you're going to call on me and come and pray to me, and I'm going to listen to you. And I will bring you back from captivity, goes on to say. I will bring you back to the place where I have carried you into exile. You see, God, if you're in the waiting room for God to turn around a bad business decision, for God to turn around a terrible relationship decision that you made, for God to turn around, fill in the blank, some dream or some idea that was yours, and he hasn't specifically come to you and said, this is what I'm going to do. Hey, I'm anointing you king. Someday you're going to be king. Uh, Here's what happens. We're in wishful thinking, and we're taking this promise, and we're applying it to ourselves. Here's what we can all apply to ourselves. God has a plan for us. And ultimately, God's plan is going to lead to our good and not our harm. But not specifically all the details that we often think. He was fulfilling a promise to them. Now, here's the second one. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. It's basically a promise that many have used to say, you know what, no matter what happens financially, I'm going to be okay. Because it says, my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Yep, that's a promise the Apostle Paul made from God to a group of people in a church called Philippi. And it was printed in the letter to them that we now call Philippians. And in verse 4, 19, it says this. But here's the thing. This is a promise that was made to them because of their generosity. It's not a promise that every stingy Christian can make to say, well, I've been stingy with God and the fact I lost my job, he's going to somehow send a check to take care of me or do this or do that. That's not the promise that every Christian is going to have every need met. It's a promise that was made to generous Christians. At the very most, what I can do, if I'm a generous Christian and putting God's kingdom first, not leftovers or someday out of an emotional little tug or something, then maybe I can halfway apply this to myself. Let's let's read the whole context. Philippians 4, beginning of verse 14. Again, not on the board, just listen to it. Paul says, you know, it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as all of you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when you were brand new Christians, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. You were the only church that supported me financially. And then he goes on to say, I've received full payment and have more than enough. I'm amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphrodites the gifts that you sent. They're a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice. They are pleasing to God. And Greek word dia, which means therefore, because of this, my God will meet all of your needs according to his riches. In glory. Who is the your? The Philippians, generous Christians. So once again, I don't want to become angry at God and I don't want to go, wow, I'm really doing a great job in God's waiting room as I'm waiting for something that he never promised. I am uh, made some goofy decisions and they're not working out. Ah, oh, but he's going to make me prosper. I've been a stingy Christian. Ah, but he's going to meet all of my needs. No, he might teach me a lesson and actually let me go to the point of great, great need. Now, if this hasn't bugged you enough, this will get some emails. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, is one more example. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, this word old here is literally bearded. In other words, when, when the, it's speaking of a son, hits full maturity, what's he going to do? When he hits maturity, he will not depart. Now, what many of us have done with this passage is we turn it into this. When they are old and hit maturity and depart, when they get really old, they're going to come back. And there's nothing in this passage about coming back And there's nothing in this passage about way late in life. This is not a promise that every kid raised in a Christian home is going to come back to Jesus. First of all, because we all have free will. 
You go all the way back to the Garden of, of Eden, and you have Adam and Eve with no sin nature, perfect environment, and yet they rebel against God. And as parents, I want to tell you, all we can do is we can influence, which is a very, very important thing. And then what we're held responsible for, but we can't control. People have the free will and the free choice. Now, that doesn't mean you don't pray like crazy. That doesn't mean like in the prodigal son parable in Luke, you don't keep the door open for anyone who wants to return. Uh, that's all great. We hope for, we do everything we can to bring that about. But what I want to remind you is this is a proverb, not a promise. Notice what book it's in, the book of Proverbs, which starts out saying this, the Proverbs of Solomon. Now, what is a proverb? A proverb is a pithy statement about how life generally works. It's not called the promises. That's not the name of this book. It's Proverbs. Here is how life generally works. And then he lays out all kinds of practical wisdom for his son Rehoboam, I believe, is what it was co compiled for, who ironically didn't follow it, so that he would be a wise and a successful king. So, the big deal here is when you are stuck in God's waiting room, you and I need to step back and say, am I waiting for a promise that God has made? Or am I getting frustrated with God because of something he never promised and never said he would do? Now, Having said that, I want to be honest, sometimes only time is going to tell. Uh, you know, there, there, it was pretty clear for David. I mean, the prophet shows up, he takes out the oil, he anoints him. Uh, that's a pretty big deal. But let's be honest, for most of us, that's not how God works. I know I, I consider myself incredibly blessed that there's been three times in my life where, uh, where God's intervention or speaking, if you will, of instructing me to do something was so clear, absolutely clear, that I knew like, whoa, this is God. But I want to tell you, every other major decision, every other inner prompting, every other sense of a dream, every other direction that in hindsight I can see God was at work at, every single other one in my life has been more of an inner prompting, a sense of, you know, I think and, and I've often quoted to you, I, I just circle and highlight it again on your, your, your note sheet, the, the story in Acts chapter 16, verses 6 to 10, where you've got the Apostle Paul, of all people, talk about filled with the Spirit, a guy ought to know what God's doing, have, laying out this plan for a mission trip to go back and bless the churches that, that he and Barnabas had started. And, and uh, as, as he goes out, uh, nothing works out. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phygia and Galatia, Acts 16 says. They, why? Because they were kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia, where they wanted to go. They totally thought that's what God wanted, and nothing they could do could get him through. Well, then they came to the border of Mysia, and they thought, well, this is where God wants us to go. They were absolutely sure, and guess what happens? The Spirit of Jesus wouldn't let us go. And then one night they have a dream about some people in a region called Macedonia saying, come and help us. And they go, well, we figured maybe this must be of God. And so they went. And this time they got through. In the rearview mirror, it was like, yeah, this is God. This is where the Philippian church started. This is where all kinds of amazing things began to happen. But here's the thing. They didn't know it all ahead of time. They were thinking, I think God is doing this. I think God is doing this. And therein lies some very practical advice. When you have a sense, and I have a sense, that God is calling us to something, let's be careful and not jump to saying too quickly, God told me or God called me. Learn to say, I think God is telling me. Learn to say, I think God is, is, is leading me. And here's why. Because when you say God told me and God didn't tell you, you've spoken presumptuously. And you lose your spiritual credibility with your friends, with your loved ones, with your kids, with your mom and dad. You, you, you see, the Bible is quite clear about those who speak presumptuously and say, well, the Lord said or the Lord will. And it's a one and done principle. You know, we, I, I, I see pastors who make prophecies about this or about this or whatever, and then it doesn't come true, and they almost act like, well, I just kind of missed it. Like, dude, you didn't say, I think the Lord was telling me. You said the Lord is telling me. And everybody lined up and did something on it, or maybe your family lined up and did something on it. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 18. 
because there's always going to be static on the line. On our, it's not God's message is unclear. It's the sin in our life makes the reception of it unclear. It's like you're calling me on the phone and your cell phone, and you've got great connection where you are, but if I don't have great connection where I am, uh, we're going to drop a few lines or a few words. Here's what Deuteronomy 18, 21 to 22 says. You may say to yourselves, well, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? And he says, pretty simple. If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord doesn't take place or come true, that's a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously, so do not fear them. Do not be alarmed. Don't listen to them anymore. They've lost all credibility. So be very, very careful when you're in God's waiting room or even at the beginning of the process to say, God told me when you're not so sure. David had absolutely no doubt. And when you're in the waiting room, I want to tell you this as well. Don't be surprised when God seems to move more like a glacier than an avalanche. Don't be surprised (laughs) that God's timetable and calendar is so different than ours. Because our tendency is always this, that that God moves quickly. Uh, You know, there's a story in the book of, (coughs) um, yeah, Daniel where he is praying to the Lord and it's 21 days until an angel actually shows up with the answer Daniel is asking for, some insight and understanding into what's going on as they're stuck in Babylon. And, and, and the angel says, well, I was sent by the Lord, but there was a spiritual battle with the enemies of the Lord that took 21 days before he got through. And he says, the archangel came and kind of broke through and now here I am. And I'm thinking, that does not fit my God Bible theology paradigm. But it's what the Bible says. I I imagine if God were to say, hey, send Larry the answer right now, that I'd have the answer, boom, instantly. And yet here you have Daniel. God says, yeah, send the answer. And 21 days later, and God just tells us what happened. He didn't explain why or how. I wish he did. I wish I had easy answers to these things. But here's what I've learned. God's timetable never moves at my pace. 2 Peter 3, 8 to 10, we've quoted often that uh, with the Lord is not slow about keeping his promises, but a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day to the Lord. Kind of reminds me of a lesson from a dead man named Lazarus. You might or might not be familiar with the story. It's found in John 11, verses 1 to 45. John 11, 1 to 45. Circle it on your note sheet. And here's what happened. Uh, Jesus is told that his dear friend Lazarus is very, very sick. And so what does Jesus do? He waits two days before heading towards Lazarus' home. And by the time he gets there, Lazarus has been dead for four days. Let me read you parts of this story. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. So Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. And when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it's for the glory. uh, It's for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now catch that. That's a pretty clear promise, isn't it? This sickness will not end in death. Now let's go through the experience they had as God fulfills a promise about Lazarus. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Excuse me. God, if you love me, you're going to go right now, right? No, this passage says he loved Mary, he loved Martha, he loved Lazarus, and so, I've got that circle and highlight in my Bible, because of this, what did he do? He didn't drop everything and run towards them, he waited two more days. And things get bad. Verse 17 says, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. And when Martha hears that Jesus is coming, she runs out to meet him. uh, and, and, And she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And then Mary, once he gets there, uh, runs out and falls at his feet and cries out, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. This is a waiting room in which you feel like now you've been kicked out of the waiting room. All hope is gone. And some people standing around said, listen, couldn't this prophet, this guy who has opened the eyes of blind people, couldn't he have taken care of Lazarus? What's up with this? 
Well, it says Jesus was deeply moved. Long story short, he goes to the cave where Lazarus is, is buried, and he says, take away the stone. So they took away the stone, and Jesus calls in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. Ah, the promise was actually fulfilled. He didn't say Lazarus wouldn't die. That's what they all would have thought, what you and I would have thought. He said this will not end in the death of Lazarus. So he tells him to come out, and the dead man comes out, his hands and his feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And here's the end result. Therefore, because of this, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. It was to the glory of God. It was to the glory of Jesus. It was to the salvation of others. And yet in the midst of it, man, it didn't seem like any of that was going on. And that's often how God's waiting room is. You see, we always read in the stories that give us faith and encouragement, we're reading the end of the story, but the problem is we're living in the middle of the story. And when you're in the end of the story, you've got different information than any of us ever have when we are in the middle of the story. And we always tend to overestimate what's going to happen in one year and greatly underestimate what God is going to do in five. You know, the Bible's like a highlight reel. We read the book of Acts in 30 minutes, but it took 30 years for it take, to take place. It might seem like the speed of an arthritic snail, but we've been 21 weeks is all we've been in this teaching series. From David being anointed as king to David being coronated as king. 21 weeks, long sermon series. But it was 25 years for David. I've talked before about Abraham's promised land. When the people move in, the Lord tells them, I'm not going to drive out everybody in a single year. I'm going to do it little by little so you don't get too much too fast and the wild animals don't take over. He tells Abraham when he promises him that his descendants will get the promised land in Genesis 15, that it's got no for certain for 400 years, your descendants are going to be strangers in a country, not their own, that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. Hey, here's your promise. But by the way, it's going to be four centuries. And during those four centuries, you're going to be enslaved and you're going to be mistreated. And then I'm going to do all that I said. You see, the great promise that we're in the waiting room for is not, even if you got something as clear as David did with his anointing, is not that you'll be king someday. It's not that God will heal this disease. It's not that God will fix this problem. It's not that God will establish this endeavor, this dream. It's that our sins are forgiven and we have eternity, eternity that we're going to be living with Jesus Christ. I love how Mark chapter 8 verse 36 puts it. For what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? I mean, the exchange? <laughs> give me my soul. Give me forgiveness. Give me eternity. And whatever else is lost along the way, well, that's the way it is. But if it's going to work out that way, if God's going to work like, more like a glacier than avalanche, here practically is some advice. Expect some confusion when God's at work. That's why it's called faith. See, once again, we think, well, when God is at work, I'm going to see it. Nope, you tend to see it through the rearview mirror far more than you do the front windshield or the side windows. And, and that's not just you and your lack of faith. That's God's people throughout history. And that's why it's called faith. If we could see it, it's not faith. If we could see it, it's just a fact. And faith is believing a fact that hasn't yet take place yet. I pointed out when we we're going through the first part here of 2 Samuel, in chapter 5, verse 12, David knew after the king of Tyre had sent workers that the Lord had established his, as king. That's when it just deeply went to him like, wow. This is absolutely true. And along the way, I want to tell you, he was one confused dude. He kept his mustard seed of faith despite all of his doubts and confusion. He, he didn't take things into his own hands. He didn't quit. But along the way, I want to tell you, he was riddled with all kinds of doubts, just like you and I can be in that waiting room. In chapter 20, he was frustrated, and he tells Jonathan, his buddy, you know, there's just a step between me and death. That's how he viewed life. Like, I'm, I'm hanging on by a thread. One misstep, and I'm a dead man. 
The next chapter, chapter 21, he flees to a place called Gath, and it says, quote, he was very much afraid. So he pretended to be crazy in the presence of the king of Gath and found some solitude and some protection there. He was, quote, very much afraid. In chapter 23, he's running for his life, and he's having to hide in caves. Wherever Saul goes, he's got to go somewhere else. And in chapter 27, it says this, David thought to himself, one of these days I'm going to be destroyed by the hand of Saul. The best thing I can do is to, to escape to the land of the Philistines, and then Saul stops searching. Catch this. Mustard seed of faith, tiniest thing you can imagine. There ain't a lot there. David is thinking to himself, one of these days I will be king. Oh, I'm sorry. One of these days I will be destroyed. Have you ever been there in your own life? You know the promise of God. You know what God has said. But in the midst of it, you're just feeling like, I know it's not going to work. I know it's not going to work. Hang on to that mustard seed of faith. Do the right thing. Don't quit. God is not going to reward you for your positive thinking, for your optimism. God is going to reward you for your obedience, even when you're doing something you think has no power and no ability to work. There's a cool story in the book of Acts about a prayer meeting where they were praying that, that Peter would be delivered from the death sentence that was supposed to come upon him the next day. And, uh, and, and when Peter is delivered and actually taken out of prison miraculously, he goes to the house of that prayer meeting. He knocks on the door. A little uh, servant girl named Rhoda looks and goes, ah, it's Peter. And she runs back and tells everybody, Peter's here. And so what do they do? They go, oh, hallelujah, our prayers have been answered. No, they go, oh, crud. It must be his ghost. He must have died. I read that passage and I go, oh, I can pray that way. I can go through the act of praying, even though I'm pretty sure it's worthless. So worthless that when God answers it, I go, well, I guess he didn't. It's a mustard seed of faith that keeps you going on in the, God's waiting room. Don't listen to the whisper of the enemy that says, no, your faith is not good enough because it's not strong enough. It's not optimistic enough. It's not happy enough. Just keep on keeping on and God will always come through. Well, a couple of other just quick reminders. I've got to say, we've talked about them before in the past, but I need to say them because I know not all of you have heard all the messages and it's something else more important. If we're really trying to teach you something, Chris Brown and I don't always want to bring you some new thought where you go, wow, that's interesting. We actually have got to get some things so deep into you that whether we're around or not, you know them. You know, every now and then somebody comes up to me with a, 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 a note sheet uh, and they tell me they filled it out before the sermon was actually preached. And they have this sense of, I got you. But the truth is, no, we got you. You know it so well you don't need us. And that's what I'm hoping that these two will be for you. Not new, but reminders of what we can so quickly forget. And that is, we never want to do the wrong thing to hurry up the right thing. And that's the temptation, not in the avalanche, that's the temptation in the glacier. First uh, Peter 5.10 says, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he can lift you up in due time. We never want to help God out by trying to speed things up by doing the wrong thing to get the right results. Never. And by the way, David did this pretty well. <laughs> We've seen he's not the hero of the story. God is. And he's done all kinds of goofy and crazy and inappropriate and it's sinful things. But he never stepped in to speed up God's timetable. He had two opportunities to kill King Saul. He did not do it. When somebody came to him, a Malachite saying, hey, I killed the king for you. Reward me. He rewarded him with death for taking on God's anointed. And when two guys murdered Ishbosheth, the king over the 11 tribes that he was waiting to come to him. He didn't reward them for their murder with a, a position and wealth as they thought. No, what he did is he gave them the capital punishment that a murderer deserves. The right thing at the wrong time is always going to end up in disaster. Always has, always will. Because just because I know the when, or excuse me, just because I know the what of God's will, doesn't mean the win, W-H-E-N, has come yet. Two more. At the end of the day, I want to remind you, God's timing will always prove to be perfect. 
There's not going to be anybody in heaven. None of us are going to be saying, well, it was a pretty good run, but, you know, uh, that's not going to happen. At the end of the day, God's timing, as confusing as it was, Lord, if you'd been here, Lazarus would be alive. At the end of the day, his timing was absolutely perfect. And in that waiting room, here's what we want to do. As I've told you before, our focus needs to always be on God wants us to do, not what we want God to do. Focus on what God wants you to do, not what you want God to do. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, Proverbs 5, 3 to 6 says. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, just submit to him. Do what he says, and he'll make your path straight. Whenever my focus is on what I want God to do for me, I end up putting myself in the situation where I'm leaving the path that he's got me on. It's, it's, it's as if I get all the way to the one yard line and then I walk off the playing field because things have been hard and the first three plays have gone back two yards. No, you still got one more, more play. It's called fourth down, fourth and goal. Stay there. Go all the way through. Don't quit. This whole sermon series began with a guy named Saul who had partial obedience because real full obedience didn't make sense to him. And he lost his kingdom and it was given to David. We don't want to bail out because here's what we never, ever know. We might think today's little obedience is taking us nowhere when in reality it's setting the stage for everything. I want to close with a real story, real life story from my life of a guy who bailed out too early because things weren't going well. It was during an economic downturn, and I had uh, gotten bids on a construction project, and it was more expensive than I could afford, so I'd said no. And then I got a phone call when the economy was at its bottom from this same person saying, hey, I've really got no work lined up. I can do it for X if you want. And I looked, and that was enough of a savings that we could afford to do it. So I had him do it. He did a fabulous job. Everything that was built was done well, except for one thing. At the very end, his cleanup was terrible. He just walked away. And uh, that was a mess I had to make. I got to, you know, call kind of the, you know, 1-800 junk type of thing and do some work and all that. But frankly, I had no complaint because I knew I'd gotten the work done for an incredibly good price. So it was okay, but here's the thing. I had a friend who came over and during the process had watched what was being built and had had spoken to me as as someone else uh, in, in the trades of what a good job was being done, the quality of the work. And then a few weeks later, uh, when the job had been done a couple of days, he comes back and he sees the total lack of cleaning up and getting everything straightened out. And he shakes his head. And I said, why? What's up? Well, he was a a large general contractor, and here's what he told me. He said, you know what? I've got about a million-dollar job, and I was going to contact this guy and have him do it on one of my projects. But I never have anybody do the work that doesn't know how to finish the final work. Now, here's the irony. That guy did a good job, day in and day out. I had no complaints about what he had done. But as he looked at it, he felt like, well, it's just not worth doing my normal good work because of where I've been paid or what's going on. Or I I have no idea what his reasons were. But he'd gone all the way to the one-yard line and he walked off the field. And my bet is, if I could run into this guy, he probably complained then, he might still be complaining today about the lack of opportunities that came his way never having any idea that if he treated every day as an opportunity, there was the answer to all of his concerns and all of his hopes and all of his fears right there in front of him. I think you can see the spiritual application to it. All we ever know is what God wants us to do today. Those things are crystal clear. Don't worry about tomorrow. Worry about today. And do it. And do it to the best of your ability and obey to the glory of God. And let's see what he does. Hurry up and wait. David had to. You'll have to. I have to. It's the lot of everyone who's a son and daughter of Adam.
Father, take the things that we've looked at and help us to grow in our understanding, in our faith, even if it's just a mustard seed, to hold you at your promise and keep doing the right thing so that you can end up doing the perfect thing. In your name I pray and ask it. Amen. Another great message in our series on David. We want to make sure you're getting connected this summer. So remember, go to our website, northcoastchurch.com, and look for our summer classes. Let's get connected and recharged this summer.